is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take it. Steve, um, I had the privilege of, of interviewing you and Esther Dyson just a couple of months ago. I think it was M -Health, the M Health right. Summit uh, down here. And we talked a lot about um, what it was like in the 80s when you were building America Online, when you were an unknown entrepreneur showing up. Was it PC? Forum, Esther I, I showed up forum. anywhere. I just trying to sell the dream. Most people thought we were crazy. Yeah, well, Not like you guys. You know, right. I'm sure you have the same reaction when you're talking about what you're working on. Well, it, it's it's. I want to go back there for a little bit because I think you know people think of Steve Case probably different than you know those people who knew you back when uh, knew you. But this idea that Steve Case, the entrepreneur, talking about something that literally not only didn't exist, but a lot of people didn't even understand why it would exist or if it would really come to fruition. Can you take us back a little bit? Sure. And in doing so also, you know, we're watching this healthcare industry completely get reimagined. And I think if there's any similarities right. that you can draw, that'd be helpful. Well, first of all, it's great to be here again. Congratulations on the success that you and Unity have had over the last three years. It's also great to be here with uh, Jerry Levin, who I've known for 25 years, something like that, and a, a great friend. Uh, and it's great to see so much enthusiasm, so much excitement about what's possible about reimagining you know, healthcare. And I think the, the connection in terms of my story, I actually moved to the Washington, D.C. area uh, 31 years ago. Uh, my first, you know, first uh, attempt at a startup in this uh, you know, space failed. A company uh, I joined called Gameline uh, didn't work, but luckily two of the people I met there and I ended up starting uh, what became AOL in 1985. And at the time we were launching, and it was, it was America Online because we wanted to get America Online, only 3% of people were online. And they were only online one hour a week. So when we said we wanted to get America Online, we said someday we believe this, you know, this, there'll be a, this online phenomenon and it will change how people live and connect and so forth. You know, most people thought we were crazy. And in fairness, uh, for a decade, the evidence was in favor of the theory that we were crazy because it was a slow, hard slog. Uh, even when we went public in 1992, we were the first internet company to go public. We've been at it now for seven years and we had 184,000 customers after seven years. It was hard and there were times where, where people, including my parents said like, you know, <laughs> seemed like a good idea. Uh, you, you seem really passionate about it but it's not working so well. Maybe you should go back to like working for like a real company. And, and, I, and I just stuck with it because I really believed in the idea uh, of the internet. Eventually a bunch of things started to happen. It's worth pointing out, it wasn't until 1991, so we'd been at it for quite a while, that it even was legal to connect our service to the internet. Up until then, the internet was for non-commercial use, educational institutions, government institutions. So there were a lot of reasons. Modems were not built into PCs, and there were a lot of re networks were too expensive. There were a lot of reasons that this was not taken off. Finally, it did, and we suddenly became this overnight success, but we really were a decade in the making. And I think that's the connection to what's happening uh, here, I think a lot of you have been at this for a while. There are many serial entrepreneurs who have done a number of different, different things. Uh, I think recognizing that revolutions will eventually happen, but they often happen in evolutionary ways, and having the patience and the persistence, the perseverance to stick it, stick it through, I think is critically impo important, and not giving up, not believing that it's impossible. I remember meeting uh, Nelson Mandela when he was I think he was turning 85 and visited his home, and he said something that always struck with me, and I think is relevant on, in terms of this topic. With it always seems impossible until it's done. <laughs> you know, it just it just seems impossible, particularly to most people who are kind of the naysayers. And then suddenly something happened. And I thought your slide at the beginning was very helpful in aligning the kind of the macro factors that are beginning to come together. So this is sort of a shake the snow globe moment. The technology, the you know changes in 
in, in policy, the growing uh, needs of consumers, the growing frustration that they have through technology, particularly the internet, uh, figured out better ways to manage many aspects of their lives and still puzzle why this health thing is so complicated and hard and confusing and scary. And, and so there's just a lot of factors. I really do believe, even though a number of you have been at it for a while, you know, the next five or ten years are going to be critical, but it's going to require sticking with it. It's not, it's not easy. There are easy. You know, this is a tough challenge. So one of the things you said when we were at, at M Health was this notion of what kind of companies were around you in the 80s. So we talked about print driver companies right. and spreadsheet companies and this idea that really one trick ponies kind of right. were the beginning of, of the development of a new industry. Um, a lot of times the criticism that you know, people make, executives at big companies make when they see startups come along is think, ah, oh, that's just one thing that right. we need and it's not enough. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of an in, a new industry and kind of what the right place, you know, kind of in a, as a life cycle, what actually are the beginning pieces to create that transformation? I think there are a lot of factors that have to come to play. That's why it takes a while to kind of orchestrate you know, the, you know, the, the, the revolution. Uh, but in early stages, there, there tends to be a trend of companies focusing on initially on features, and then it kind of broadens to products, and then if they're successful, it broadens to platforms. And I think we're in that kind of phase here. And I think, as you mentioned, in the, in the 80s, in the personal computer you know, business, there were some platform companies, Microsoft, for example, with, with Windows, but a lot of software companies emerged that were trying to just do one thing that in this case Microsoft wasn't, wasn't particularly doing. So there are companies that were solely focused on being spell checker software, or solely <laughs> focused on being you know, printer drivers. And some that were successful ended up evolving to doing broader things, or some would just focus on a word processor or just on a spreadsheet. Over time, these features be, kind of get amalgamated into products and then get you know, broadened into platforms. I think figuring out with your companies how to have the benefit of focus, which is obviously critical for, for any entrepreneurial success. You've got to be really sharply focused, but not so narrowly focused that you don't participate when things break into this broader kind of you know, platform opportunity. So sometimes it means adding other features. Sometimes it means combining with other companies. Sometimes it means partnering with, with other, other folks, figuring out where you're going to evolve, how you're going to evolve in this, in this ecosystem. And I think one of the, the things that's different about health, it's also true about education and, and transportation, energy. There's, there's, I've, I've said this, we're, we're about to break the third wave of the internet. The first wave, which I participated in, was, you know, was 85 to 2000, uh, was really building the internet, just building the foundation, building awareness, getting people connected. So with AOL and Cisco, a lot of companies were part of that first wave of just building the internet. The last 15 years, the second wave is building on top of the internet. So this is you know, Facebook and Twitter and a lot of other companies basically building products on top of the internet. This third wave is really integrating the internet into everyday life, things like the internet of things, so it almost becomes invisible, and using it to fundamentally reimagine and reshape big parts of our lives and big industries, health being, being critically important. You know, as you all know, because you're here, it's one sixth of our economy and it doesn't, doesn't work so well. But this third wave is actually gonna be pretty different than the second wave. And the two things that are gonna be most different, I think, are the need for partnerships, and the need for engagement on policy, because it, it's, a, uh, it, it's tough, it, tough in any business, but particularly tough in health to go it alone. You're gonna have to figure, which is why what you're trying to do with yeah. Startup Health is so <clears> important. You're gonna have to figure out some way to network yourself together and establish strategic partnerships. There's an African proverb I cite a lot, which is if you wanna go quickly, you can go alone, but if you wanna go far, you must go together. And I think that really- Can you, can you repeat that, please? You want to go quickly, you can go alone. If you want to go far, you must go together, whether it be networking with, with, with like you're doing here or connecting to other kinds of, 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 of organizations. So this partnership, which is a different skill set. There are a lot of entrepreneurs that are kind of lone rangers. They just want to come up with some product and drop it in the app store and hope it ends up being like Snapchat and it's wildly successful. Uh, but the skill around partnerships uh, is, is critical, particularly because as you all know, healthcare, while there's different segments and we can talk about that, uh, it's more of an enterprise business than it is a, a, a consumer business. That means it requires more partnerships. On the policy side, not just we're in DC and policy you know, kind of plays a role like you know, the, the Affordable Care Act, which was sort of one of these shake the snow globe moments. And there's you know, understanding policy and how it's gonna evolve will impact how these businesses will evolve, but also just recognizing that the government, whether you like it or not, and there are a lot of people in, you know, who don't, don't want to engage with the government, is actually the biggest customer and funder of healthcare. 
So if you want to revolutionize healthcare, you probably should talk to your largest customer, which, oh, by the way, is the government. Uh, so again, that need to engage on the policy side, not just re regulatory policy, but government as a customer, and your need to engage on the partnership side is, is going to be a different skill set. That is, and the companies that my guess are going to be successful in this third wave are going to still do things like, you know, the products and platform and people and passion and perseverance, some of the things that were were, were critical, but are going to add these two new ingredients around partnership and policy. Those probably will separate the the winners and losers. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason I asked you to repeat that was because I th one of the things we often talk about with entrepreneurs, and I think the, the serial entrepreneurs understand this the most, but I think what you, the way you just described the importance of it, you can either try to do this alone or you can be a part of an army of right. entrepreneurs and collaborators who want to work together. And at the end of the day, which one's going to be more powerful to actually get it done? So. And, and it's, true, it's true in sectors like health. It's also true in regions. Part of that came yesterday from this uh, conference you're mentioning, Up Global Conference, we had 525 uh, leaders of communities from 75 countries come uh, to Las Vegas for like a four-day, uh, you know, kind of startup palooza, uh, and it was great to see the excitement not just happening in the usual places, but you know, kind of in the middle of America. And then there was a guy who came from Syria who was doing you know startup weekends in Syria and Kosovo and Brazil and all all over the world. What you what, what the key to drive those is to create a network effect to create network density. You, know, you can't get liftoff unless you have that network density. That's true whether you're in Detroit or Kosovo. It's also true if you're focused on, on health. You've got to create that, that network effect. You've got to figure out how to be part of a, a, a broader you know, movement, a broader crusade, which is why things like startup health is so important. So one of the things that uh, when we first got to spend more time with Jerry many years ago talked about was everybody's got a story. Um, a reason they're passionate about doing what they're doing. I think outside of healthcare, coupon and gaming, lots of other sectors, there might not be a, as much of a, a passion or a story sometimes for, for what people are being built because of maybe an experience they had. But why are you so passionate about healthcare? I know that you're incredibly passionate about entrepreneurship and job creation and immigration, but I know you're very passionate about healthcare as well. Um, a little bit I, of I think, it, I think it's a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of like many of these things, a little bit of the head, a little bit of the heart kind of thing. On the head side, it, it is one-sixth the economy. It is going to get revolutionized. It's going to get disrupted. That makes it an interesting challenge and also creates huge business opportunity. So that, that's sort of, it's sort of a, you know, it, it, you know, it's game on. Some, you know, these things are going to get, you know, you know, pretty, you know, pretty interesting. And then on more of the, the personal side, I've had my own experiences, both just my own health, my kids' health, my brother who, who, who passed away from, uh, from cancer, watching all my, my parents you know, who are you know, uh, older and have a bunch of different issues. What, what unites all those different experiences is they don't work very well. They just, you know, just, they just don't work very well. And so trying to figure out ways to create a healthcare system that is more about health than sec, you know, which I know you all are, are focused on, and recognize there's something different about wellness and managing chronic disease and managing more acute life-threatening kind of diseases are actually different segments that operate you know, you know, differently. But how do you create better outcomes at lower cost with more convenience? And technology is not the only answer, but it's part of the answer. And consumerism isn't the only answer, but it's part of the answer. How do you take these forces of technology and innovation and getting consumers to feel more in control of their health again after having essentially outsourced it for more than a half a century to other people, mostly because the other people are, are paying. You know, they, they do care about their health. They do care about their, their family's health. They do care about their friend's health. They just have been kind of a little bit on the sidelines. How do you bring them back and so they're kind of in the driver's seat, not the passenger seat? Uh, and how to use technology as a way to innovate, to create mm -hmm. interesting products and services that, you know, improve people's lives, make the world a better place, and oh, by the way, take what is one-sixth of the economy and, and disrupt it in a way that creates you know, enormous op opportunity, and oh, by the way, how do we make sure that as a nation we lead in the innovations around that, because that will have you know, global potential. So you, you mentioned the government, such a big customer, such a big important kind of player. It's one of the reasons we launched from down here and right. thought the, you know, the, the, the uh, framework of kind of a launch pad of being in Washington was so important in the White House. The Affordable Care Act has, as you know, a lot of people are calling it now, a treasure trove of opportunities for entrepreneurs and businesses, business models and things that even just you know, 6, 12, 18 months ago weren't even available. Um, I want to tie it a little bit to job growth or potential job growth and get a little bit of your take on 
how you think it could play a role in job growth, not just from the idea of more people to run all the different mm. stuff that healthcare reform now requires, but I think the opportunities that are now opened up to entrepreneurs. Well, I think, it, I think it'll be a mixed bag. I think it'll be mostly positive, but clearly one of the things that technology will do as it's done in other industries is do things more efficiently, creating productivity gains, which, so there will be some parts of the healthcare system where jobs will be lost, or there are other parts where jobs will be you know, gained. It's not gonna be just, you know, kind of, one way, and that's inevitable. That's part of the process of, of, of uh, technology innovation. But I think that the thing that, it, I know there's a big debate and will continue for a few years, particularly when we come up around elections, around what exactly happens with the, you know, the spreadsheets in terms of how does this work and how, who's in and how do you get, get it funded. And I think it'll take a, you know, probably a, I don't know, three, four, five years for that to settle out. Uh, uh, and I'll leave that to the debate of the, you know, the accountants and the, you know, the policy wonks. I think the two things that relate to startups that are, are interesting uh, about the Affordable Care Act. Number one, it was, as I said before, a pretty fundamental change that is sort of this kind of like shaking the snow globe. And exactly how it plays out is, is unclear, but everybody has to kind of rethink what they are and where they're going based on that. As a result, people move out of their kind of comfort zone and start thinking about the art of the possible and being more open to new models and innovation. That's, I think, a really big deal. And the second is actually one of the you know, parts that didn't get as much attention by the Affordable Care Act is it actually made it much easier for people to leave big companies to start or join small companies because the, you know, the, the, the insurance was, was portable. That's a really big deal. There are a lot of people I've talked to who had, wanted to do something in the startup but were worried that they would kind of lose what they, they had. So I think that will help accelerate you know, the startup movement in general, but also startups and in, in particularly in, in, in healthcare. So I think it's a big opportunity. It's not, again, it's, it's, I, I think anybody who is focused on this as you are, will have to take that long view as we started. You know, AOL ultimately was successful. The internet now is part of everyday life. It took a decade before we really kind of you know, broke through. So don't, I think it'd be a mistake to come in thinking like, you know, launch something and you know, voila, you know, a year later it's gonna be you know, a huge hit. Maybe you'll get lucky, but most of them are gonna be a long slog over five or 10 years that requires patience and perseverance and partnerships on the thing, things we talked about. But uh, the, the, we, the inevitability that this revolution in health has now been, you know, the starting gun has been fired and it's gonna be an interesting decade with enormous opportunities uh, for startups and entrepreneurs with, with great ideas who bring the right teams together focused on the right problems and with the right kind of partners. I think it's an unparalleled opportunity and, not, and also the kind of thing that I think entrepreneurs should be focusing on. You know, one of the things I get frustrated about sometimes, although I celebrate any entrepreneur trying to do anything, is, is all too often they're focused on easy problems and have a kind of a short-term built-to-flip mentality. I don't want entrepreneurs focused on hard problems and to have a longer-term built-to-last kind of mentality. And health is a hard problem, but is there anything we, you know, we as individuals or we as a society care about more than like health? It's pretty fundamental, so let's focus our attention on that, which is why it's great, great to you know to see what's happening here, and great to be you know supporting the startup health movement. And thank you for your leadership. And now we probably should switch to the real fun part, which yeah. is the fifty-nine second yeah, pitches. Yeah. But are there any last questions? One, yeah, one, 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 one nice you know ending question because a lot of people here uh, aren't entrepreneurs, but they work with they work at companies. They're executives of insurance companies hospital systems, pharmaceutical companies, well, I government. just explained to them they can now yeah. leave because of the portability of insurance <laughs> right. and join the startup movement. <laughs> but what words of wisdom, you know, you talked about collaboration. I think one of the most important things that most startups have in terms of obstacles that they have is pilot programs, early customer development when they're just startups. They're rarely funded with more than a few hundred thousand dollars when they're beginning. Some of them even get, you know, uh, up to the gate and they're, you know, culturally the right. hospital system. What words of wisdom would you tell executives, not entrepreneurs, to kind of embrace perhaps more uh, willingly startups and entrepreneurs as, a, as an instigator of change within their organizations? Well, I think the number one thing is most of the smart people don't work for you. They work for somebody else. So get out of your office and go meet them and find out what they're doing. Most of the good ideas are not within your company, they're in somebody else's you know, company or in somebody else's garage. And I think, I think the pace of innovation, the pace of change is such that if, you, if your companies aren't understanding that and aren't figuring out ways to connect, network themselves in terms of what's happening around the, you know, the edges, around the periphery, what they're doing, they will lose their way and they will lose their 
position. And there, there definitely is a difference between attackers and defenders. And the attackers, you know, you know, usually entrepreneurs, some large companies are pretty good attackers. Google and Apple are still in that mode. By the way, Apple, if you didn't see it, launched their health platform this afternoon. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, plays out. Um, you know, there are some who even have scale are pretty innovative, but most end up being kind of defenders focusing on protecting the status quo while the entrepreneurial disruptors are trying to attack and change the game. The large entities have to figure out ways to maintain that attacker mindset. And the best way to do that is usually to network and partner with entrepreneurs doing interesting things and recognize they kind of need you as a customer or as a kind of helping to give them um, credibility. So it's mutually reinforcing, but respect what they're doing, appreciate what they're doing, be open to what they're doing, and their ideas and their technologies, their products mm -hmm. can help you know, shift what you're doing so it is more relevant in, in the future and you, you're, you are a, remain a leader as opposed to kind of, kind of lose your way. So I don't think anybody can you know, move into the protect defense, they call it, and in, in, in sports, and just focus on protecting what's there. They will, they will lose their way. You've got to go where Wayne Gretzky said, you know, I, in terms of being uh, in hockey, you have to go where the puck is going, not focus on where the puck is. That requires kind of getting out of your comfort zone, and that requires engaging with, uh, with entrepreneurs. So, you know, on all seriousness, the, the, the folks from larger companies that are here, I think it's terrific. Yeah, and, and hopefully you'll learn from these 40 pitches and meet some, some people on two, three, four of them. Actually, will be things that you will find interesting to you, and you can be helpful to them and, and build a reputation as an organization as being kind of startup friendly, open to entrepreneurs, and figure out ways to engage them, not make it hard for them, make it easy for them. That will attract more innovation, more people that ultimately will not just be interesting new business on the side, but help influence what you're doing at the, at the core of your, your business. This is the, you know, the, the, the future of these industries is evolving and innovating, which will require connecting to the world outside of you, not just focusing within your walls. Um, well, excellent. I want to I want to thank you uh, first for the fireside chat today. I really appreciate you spending the time. I know that you spent a lot of time talking to a lot of the entrepreneurs and other people in the room before. So I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I also want to thank you. As I mentioned, the first call that Jerry and I and Unity made was you when we uh, hadn't even announced this uh, here. So I want to thank you from the very beginning in the many ways that you and Startup America and Up Global have supported us. Um, don't know if you want to make any other announcements today about other ways you're supporting us, but well, I will say we haven't announced yet before, <laughs> but we are investors in in, in startup belt. We want to support the idea of building a, this network, building this you know, portfolio of, of companies. So some of it is cheerleading in startups in general, particularly cheerleading around some of these sectors that need disruption, but also being, providing some direct support uh, as a, as investor in startup health. So for the companies. That are here. I guess I'm a little investor in, in each of you. So I hope you're really successful yeah. and can change the world. I wanted everyone to understand who, when they're pitching, they're pitching among many investors, but you as an investor in startup health. Thank, thank you thank for you everything. Thank you all for being here. Look forward to hearing the pitches.